Excellencies, distinguished delegates, welcome back. We will uh, begin this afternoon with our consideration of agenda item three, strategies uh, for strengthened regional cooperation on social protection in Asia and the Pacific. The background document uh, was uh, for this agenda item is a regional action to support the, imp the implementation of the action plan to strengthen regional cooperation on social protection in Asia and the Pacific, ESCAP slash CSD slash 2022 slash 2. I now have the pleasure to invite the Secretariat to uh, deliver its presentation on this agenda item. Mr. Patrick Anderson, you will be uh, the one. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to share with you the Secretariat's presentation on Agenda Item 3, Strategies for Strengthening Regional Cooperation on Social Protection in Asia and the Pacific. Recent global events, ranging from the COVID-19 pandemic to rising fuel and energy prices, <coughs> sorry, demonstrate the devastating impact large-scale crises can have on all segments of society. These events have highlighted the need to ensure the resilience of populations to cope with such crises and the importance social protection plays to cushion the impact of these disruptions. Despite this significant potential of social protection to transform societies, more than half of the population in Asia and the Pacific are left unprotected against normal life events or larger crises. Many countries in the region also spend less than 2% on, of their GDP on social protection. The regional averages is slightly below 5%, but it also stands in stark contrast to the global average of 12.9%. Recognizing social protection as both a fundamental right and an effective mechanism for promoting sustainable development the Committee on Social Development endorsed the action plan to strengthen regional cooperation on social protection in Asia and the Pacific at its last session held on 20 and 21st October in 2020. The importance of this action plan was reaffirmed in ESCAP Resolutions 771 and 781. The action plan serves as a shared vision, strategy and platform for ESCAP member states to accelerate action on social protection by promoting partnership peer learning, good practices, and to identify capacity building needs. To support this, ESCAP was requested to consolidate national experiences on the implementation of the action plan into per periodic uh, progress reports, to develop a regional platform to facilitate peer learning and the sharing of good practices, and to provide technical advice and capacity building support upon request. To take stock of national progress, the Secretariat, together with the UNDP and ILO, conducted a rapid regional baseline survey. We're happy to share here some preliminary results from the responses received from so far 12 governments. On the financing, the two dark upper bars shows that only one quarter of the responding governments consider their social protection system to be sufficiently funded to provide adequate cover coverage. However, almost all these governments have a plan in place to allocate more funds within the next five to ten years. In terms of adequacy of benefit levels, shown by the following two red bars, three quarters of governments have conducted a national assessment on the adequacy of social protection benefits and, uh, during the past five years. In two thirds of these countries, the assessment led to an increase of existing benefits. In relation to national targets shown by the two pink bars, three quarters of all governments have identified national targets on coverage levels. All these countries have reported progress to achieve these national targets in official communication. Finally, the bottom bar shows that 83% of all governments have a regular mechanism through which they consult national civil society entities and the private sector organizations in the development and implementation of their social protection schemes. These results highlight some of the gaps, but also achievements and uh, actions going on by governments in implementing the action plan. 
Distinguished delegates, for this agenda item, the committee is invited to share experience on actions taken at the national level to extend social protection coverage with a view to implementing the action plan. It's also invited to take note of the measures taken by the Secretariat to support the implementation of the action plan and to provide guidance on the future work of the Secretariat on social protection. Finally, we wish to remind all delegations who have not already done so to please complete the baseline survey. This will allow us to better understand the situation of social protection in the region and to deliver on what you requested us to do in the action plan, namely to consolidate national experiences on the implementation of the action plan. The different ways to access this short survey are shown on the screen, but of course you can also write to us. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the presentation of the agenda item three, but before I give the floor back to the chair, we would like to take the opportunity to again screen a short video that introduces you to the recently developed online one-stop shop platform called the Social Protection Online Toolbox, or SPOT for short. That platform hosts intergovernmental information, knowledge products, capacity building resources, advocacy material, and the ESCAP Protection Simulator. ESCAP Social Protection Simulator. I thank you for your attention and uh, request to please if we can play the video. Thank you. Social protection is a powerful tool to lift people out of poverty and build resilience in Asia and the Pacific. However, this potential is curbed. More than half of the region's population has no access to it and many countries in Asia and the Pacific spend less than 2% of their GDP on social protection. With less than eight years to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, how can countries accelerate action? The social protection online tool, SPOT, was developed by the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific to support countries' implementation of the Regional Action Plan. On spot, users can simulate, learn and explore policy options to achieve social protection for all. Spot supports countries in their policy making. The Spot Simulator puts data into the hands of users enabling them to estimate the cost of introducing a variety of social protection schemes and their impact on poverty, inequality and consumption, all at the touch of a button. In the Philippines, extending non-contributory benefit levels for children, persons with disabilities and older persons could boost household consumption by as much as 52%. Introducing a universal and non-contributory benefit package in Georgia could reduce the inequality between the richest 20% and the poorest 20% by up to 39%. And in the Maldives, the same social protection package could eliminate extreme poverty. In these three countries, as well as in all other SCAP countries for which we have data, the cost of these packages would only range from 2.3 to 3.9% of GDP. Upon completing the SPOT e-learning course, users will learn a range of other key social protection concepts and approaches that are essential for designing effective and inclusive social protection schemes. SPOT invites you to explore a repository of research, advocacy tools and evidence of what works. SPOT acts as a guide towards achieving social protection for all. In October 2020, countries across Asia and the Pacific adopted the action plan to strengthen regional cooperation on social protection and 12 national actions to strengthen their social protection systems. By empowering users with data and knowledge, SPOT is a one-stop shop to support countries on this journey. Together, we can build the social protection systems we need.
I thank you, Mr. Anderson, for a comprehensive overview of this agenda item and the video presentation uh, that introduced the new social protection online tool, which is called Shortly Spot. I believe uh, the delegates have had uh, time to see it, uh, the simulation outside of the, this committee uh, conference room. I firmly believe that this tool will provide great support to our countries in implementation of their action plan. I do recommend all the countries to oversee the data set which is provided to this spot uh, tool because only on the right data, only on the right evidence, we can make the right decisions in order to have better policies for our people. Distinguished delegates, we will now proceed with the panel discussion, uh, national initiatives uh, to implement the action plan to strengthen regional cooperation on social protection in Asia and the Pacific. Delegates are reminded that country statements on agenda item three will follow after this panel uh, discussion. I now have the pleasure to invite Mr. Tata to moderate this um, discussion. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, colleagues, a very good afternoon to you. It is my pleasure to moderate this high-level panel discussion on national initiatives to implement the action plan to strengthen regional cooperation on social protection in Asia and the Pacific. Through this panel discussion, we hope to explore key gaps and opportunities in achieving more inclusive and comprehensive social protection systems among countries and to better understand the readiness to implement the action plan. By implementing the 12 national actions contained in the action plan, countries can move towards achieving social protection systems for all as expressed in SDG 1.3 and accelerate implementation of the 2030 agenda. To support the national implementation of the action plan, ESCAP is collaborating with four countries represented on this panel. And the panelists will share some key insights from their countries to introduce the country dialogue for this agenda item. We have four very prominent speakers with us. First of all, our chair has graciously agreed to shoulder the role of panel member for this panel discussion. I also now have the honor to invite His Excellency Mr. Boro Samheng, uh, uh, the minister, delegation attached to the Prime Minister and Secretary of State of the Ministry of Social Affairs, Veteran the Youth Rehabilitation of Cambodia, to join us at the rostrum, please. We also have two distinguished panelists joining us online. Ms. Celia Rias, a former president of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and an acknowledged expert in this area, as well as Ms. Catherine Haswell, United Nations resident coordinator for Maldives, who has been leading the UN system, UN country team there to support the social protection efforts of the country. A warm welcome to you all and our sincere appreciation to all the panelists for being with us today. This is really an opportunity to hear a variety of experiences from countries and the different strategies to strengthen social protection systems. Excellencies, uh, delegates, we have two rounds of discussion. The first round will help set the overall landscape of social protection in the four countries. And through the second round, we hope to examine experiences as well as some specific gaps and opportunities in extending social protection to all in our region. We have roughly about 45 minutes for this discussion, and it is my request to the distinguished panelists to stay within four to five minutes for each of your responses to my questions. I would like to start by turning to our first speaker, Her Excellency Ms. Arun, Arun Zaya Ayush, Ms. Ayush has held several prestigious portfolios in her government, including as Minister in the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection and as Chairperson of the National Statistical Office. It's really a uh, really wide variety of very relevant experience. Your Excellency, Mongolia has been long been hailed as one of the champion countries on extending social protection in Asia Pacific and has achieved one of the highest social protection coverage levels in our region. Can you share with us some of the key reasons for this success story? Thank you so much. Um, well, Mongolia is uh, a very uh, unique country 
we are having 3.4 million people of population, and the country is four times bigger than Germany. So we are second on density, or even the first in density in the, in the world. So you can go per one square kilometer, and mm -hmm. you can meet only one person. So there are two persons per square kilometer on density. Um, after then, in the 90s, we just had uh, the transition from the uh, socialist uh, central planning um, planned um, country to free uh, democratic uh, um, free economy country. So the social, uh, although social insurance has the history of 80 years uh, this year, uh, the new laws has been put out in uh, late, uh, in, in the middle of the 90, uh, 1994 and 1995. We're having uh, now compulsory health insurance, so everyone is insured mm -hmm. with the health insurance. Health insurance is universal. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone who works officially in the official labor is also compulsory insured with social insurance. And the social insurance uh, payment by uh, voluntary, uh, voluntary base is also very high. So on the working force itself, we are having 87% coverage of the working force by the social insurance. Uh, so the social insurance and the social um, protection uh, policies are quite good, and especially the um, universal child support program is the one which has helped us very much during the COVID times. It has been the tool to uh, reach to all the families, because you know, in Mongolia, um, 65% of the population is under age of 35. The third of the population is children. So that's why through the universal child support money we have achieved a good success during the COVID times. Here I would like to stop for the first. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ayush, for your interesting elaboration of, its, of Mongolia's pioneering efforts in acceleration, accelerating social protection. And I'm sure we'll go deeper into certain challenges in the second round. Next, I have the pleasure to invite His Excellency Mr. Boros Samheng to take the floor. Mr. Samheng is the Minister of the Delegation attached to the Prime Minister, but also serves as Secretary of State in the Ministry of Social Affairs, Veterans and Youth Rehabilitation, and is also the Chairperson of the National Social Assistance Fund. He was also a member of the group of experts that drafted the Action Plan and is a keen supporter of regional cooperation to support social protection in our region. Your Excellency, Cambodia is demonstrating strong political leadership in reforming the social protection system. Can you share with us some highlights of how this came about and probably offer uh, some insights for the benefits of countries embarking on a similar journey? Over to you. Mr. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tata. First, I'd just like to acknowledge that there's a lot of countries here that have done great in social protection. I think we uh, just, in terms of the jump, we may be able to see the gap that we may take the leap. I think just connect to that, uh, we started about a few years back with, I think the number was much less than less than 1% of GDP. And I think now we are closing in the 2% gap. I think that's what the, the uh, Patrick was, uh, presentation was talked about. So what does that mean to us? I think, uh, uh, I think when we're coming to, when the SDG goal was put together, we start to acknowledge our, our system are not but so focus more on supply side, school, health center, all that. And then we start to see that there are programs that invest in, in the demand side, but they were all scattered. And they are not powerful and they're not able to do a, a push a nationwide process. We have a poverty identification for 10, 13 years. All we can offer was healthy fund uh, where poor family can go to use health care for free of charge. Uh, but that was about 2 million out of 15 million population size. So when we realized that this is not going to solve the problem, that's when we start to develop this social protection framework in line with the regional action plan, where we start to put, bring in all programs that exist under Ministry of Education, Ministry of Social Welfare, Ministry of Labor, to put them together and start to see how do we expand this to a life cycle approach. Where are these other citizens lie? How do we 
create a scheme that could fit more for the, the former worker? How do we create a scheme that could fit more for the poverty, the lowest quantile group? And from there, I, uh, I think now uh, is the jump. I think at the start, we didn't expect how this project could expand so fast. I think by 2019, my project that I ran at the time was just pregnant women and cash transfer. And we only target about 50,000 people, maybe about $5 million budget. COVID-19 hit, we have 2 million data people in database already. We're able to expand our cash benefit to 3 million people, jump from 50,000 people to 3 million people. And we spent from uh, roughly $5 million to uh, just this last year was almost $400 million. So that's what the Cambodian is a huge money. Uh, each family would receive an average of $40 uh, 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 a month. So, so this is a very big investment in terms of, uh, of what we're able to achieve. At the same time, we have to shut down many projects just uh, across ministry just to make sure the finance is available. And I think this uh, is something maybe I can share a bit later. Thank you, Dr. Zuna. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Samhang. I'm sure there will be challenges that you'll share later and how you address them. And thank you for your valuable insights into Cambodia's experience in developing its social protection system. I now have to have the pleasure to turn to Ms. Celia Reyes. Uh, Ms. Reyes was the first female president of the Philippines Institute of Development Studies, where she strengthened the research capacity of the institute and served two consecutive terms. She has also worked as advisor to her government on poverty monitoring and indicator systems in the Philippines. As a researcher, she specializes in poverty, inequality, social protection, as well as data collection. Ms. Reyes is joining us online. Ms. Reyes, the Philippines has, an establish, has established a framework and strategy on social protection which is grounded in the social protection floor and outlined in the Philippines Development Plan 2017-2022. How has this approach enabled the design and delivery of social protection in your country? Ms. Reyes, over, over to you. Thank you. Um, I think the presence of an established framework and strategy on social protection has actually led to progressive realization of the social protection floor. Uh, the government of the Philippines has established various social protection schemes to strengthen the socioeconomic resilience of its population. And the Philippine Development Plan has mapped out clear targets in building safe, resilient, and sustainable communities through expansion of social protection coverage for Filipinos in need and ultimately transform the society towards equity and resilience. During 2017 to 2021, the government has improved social protection financing and institutional arrangements. The efforts include the convergence of government efforts through a national registry of poor households, or what we call listahanan, the approval and adoption of the social protection plan for 2020 to 2022, expansion of the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation, or what we call PhilHealth, and the social pension coverage, and enhancement of our conditional cash transfer program, or what we call the four Ps. Legislations and reforms were also filed during this period um, including a nutrition program, uh, Philippine Identification System Act, Universal Health Care Act, mandatory uh, field health coverage for all persons with disability, um, expanded maternity leave law, Social Security Act, Magna Carta of the Poor, Safe Spaces Act, the Four Peace Act, and the Community-Based Monitoring System and National Commission of Senior Citizen Act, among others. And the importance of social protection was also demonstrated with the inclusion of measures to protect those most likely to be affected by um, reforms that we have been implementing recently. So, for instance, um, a tax reform called TRAIN included an unconditional cash transfer program to mitigate its possible inflationary impact in low-income households. Moreover, the rice tarification law contributed to food security and resiliency, especially among low-income households, and provided a package of assistance to rice farmers to improve their competitiveness given this new training regime. And in the case of the Philippines, um, we have um, some of our key social protection programs, including a conditional cash transfer program, health insurance program, social pension for the elderly, and social security system. So, for instance, our conditional cash transfer program um, was initiated in 2008 and has become a regular program of the national government by the passage of Republic Act um, 11310. Um, and um, 
This national poverty reduction strategy and a human capital investment program provides poor households with conditional cash transfers to improve their health, nutrition, and education. And um, to, the, to date, um, the number of beneficiaries has actually reached 4.4 million families. Um, on the other hand, we have our national health insurance program that seeks to provide um, health care to all Filipinos, uh, providing health insurance coverage for all Filipinos and ensuring affordable, acceptable, available, and accessible health care services for all. And um, to date, uh, we have, I think, number of beneficiaries have reached over 42 million as of 2021. Um, we also have a social pension for indigent senior citizens, and more recently, we've actually expanded the benefits from uh, about 10 U.S. dollars per month to 20 U.S. dollars. And um, finally, we also have our social security system, um, which seeks to provide um, insurance for its members and beneficiaries against the hazards of old age, disability, and death, among others. So these are just some of the programs um, that... Um, actually tend to um, ensure that the country's social protection, uh, social protection system is responsive in order to maintain the country healthy and resilient while it adjusts to changes caused by crisis and adapt to the new normal. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Reyes. That was a very comprehensive reflection on the landscape of social protection in Philippines. And I'll come back in the second round, perhaps, with a little more specific insights into some of the challenges. Uh, last but not least, the last question in this round, uh, I'm really uh, happy to give the floor to my UN colleague, Ms. Catherine Haswell, who is the resident coordinator in Maldives. Ms. Haswell brings 24 years of development and humanitarian experience in Asia, Africa, Europe, and Middle East. And she also served um, not only in, um, in a range of UN agencies, but in the regional commissions in Europe as well as Western Asia. So, Catherine, my question to you is, the Maldives has achieved universal old age pension coverage through a mixture of contributory and non-contributory schemes. It is also achieving near universal health coverage. Given the country's geographical challenges, can you share with us some of the lessons learned in achieving universal coverage in Maldives and how this was implemented across the country? Over to you, Catherine. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you um, for the opportunity to join you all today. Uh, quite a contrast because I follow on from the Philippines. Maldives has 400,000 people, so it's a very, very small country. Um, the constitution of the Maldives uh, that was uh, published in 2008 uh, guarantees a number of rights to social protection, um, including a pension under Clause 38, where everyone engaged in employment with the state shall have the right of pension as provided by law. So from 2009, the Pension Act was established and created a new autonomous body, the Maldives Pension Administrative Office, which manages the country's pension schemes. Um, it also established the old age basic pension and introduced a new contributor scheme, the Maldives Retirement Pension Scheme, that is intended to cover all employees of the formal sector. So participants of, the, of this pension scheme um, are required to pay 14% of their base wage. And this is the only unambiguously social insurance program for both state and private employees in formal employment in the Maldives. Following a series of reforms and adjustments over the past decade, there's been many, um, by the end of 2020, Maldives um, was estimated to have spent 2.94% of its GDP as pension expenditure, which is 5% of its national budget for 2021, despite having only 5% of the population classified as elderly. So this spending level um, is comparable to expenditures reported in some OECD nations with high levels of uh, aging population, such as Iceland, Chile, China, South Korea, who all have more than 11% um, and still report pension expenditures levels comparable to the Maldives um, at, at close to 3% of GDP. So this indicates that perhaps the Maldives is reaching high social security expenditure well ahead of ageing population. So what have we learned? The government is looking at five key things. Better targeting, so adjusting the basic pension to be made fully taken into consideration other personal incomes, um, and also to establish a centralised database so that it can collect information and then 
to effectively target pensions against personal income. The second one is to stop the arbitrary increases to pension parameters, which has happened um, during this period. And, and they'll need to put in place appropriate review processes, which consider a range of technical input, um, as well as comprehensive forward-looking fiscal impact analysis. Um, the third one, to make more legislative changes, which can actually address and resolve issues related to pension duplication. Um, the fourth, improve the investment returns of the current contributing pension scheme so that contributors retire with a greater savings balance. Um, and fifth, and I must say the most important for us from the leaving no one behind perspective, um, the, the pension schemes will need to be reformed to create greater fiscal space to serve at-risk populations in the Maldives. So the modelling predicts that if reforms are implemented and the right reforms, between 2021 and 2030, the government could save up to $220 million. Remember, we have 400,000 people. So that's a big amount of money for a government. Um, it also suggests that if this was done, the vulnerable and at most at-risk population of the Maldives um, will no longer be underserved by um, the current social protection systems. On the universal health coverage, um, there is a universal health insurance scheme, as you allude to, um, which began in 2012, and it covers both inpatient and outpatient treatment, including drugs and diagnostics, and it's fully financed by the government. So um, it's been, it's one of these things that uh, Maldivians are very proud about, and it's a big achievement that was put in place um, back in 2012. Five key things we've learned. We need to increase the reach um, and access for Maldivians. Um, the information we have suggests that the scheme has, in a positive way, contributed to reaching out to the entire population across the country. Um, and you allude this to this in your question. It's 182 local islands um, uh, it's across a span of almost 800 kilometres north to south. Um, big distances with small populations um, in between on these 182 islands. Um, but what we've seen, though, is that um, uh, dependents and informal sector workers um, will be benefiting more from um, this scheme than other groups, which is a positive thing, but more needs to be done. Second, migrant workers are an incredibly vulnerable group in the Maldives. And right now, it seems that um, despite um, uh, some coverage, uh, there is a high level of out-of-pocket health expenditures that migrant workers need to pay. And this is something we need to look at and streamline. Um, third, um, that we've noticed that there's been a steep rise in both government and out-of-pocket health expenditure for households as well. Um, so it's led to um, a, an adverse impact on financial protection especially for the poorest households. So um, this is something, one of the twin policy objectives that we'll need to work with the government to help them support. Fourth, fiscal sustainability, as I mentioned earlier with the social protection side, um, there needs to be balance between financial protection and total health expenditure. And that's a big problem for um, a small country. So there'll need to be a little bit more focus on innovative purchasing of health services um, as well as cost efficiency of the health system, uh, especially as we start moving towards um, an aging population and the increase in non-communicable diseases. Um, so we see that there could be substantial savings for the scheme um, by also looking at bulk procurement of essential and generic drugs, remembering that everything comes and is imported from outside the Maldives, as well as trying to reduce the level of expenditure on overseas treatment, um, which could be better negotiated with providers. And then finally, just improved availability of household survey information and a continuous cycle of analysing administrative data. It's something we see in many countries, particularly in SIDS, this challenge we face across the board on data. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Catherine. You've been very comprehensive in your response and you covered certain areas that I was intending to ask you as a part of my second round. So that was great. So we come to the end of our first round of questions. Uh, we start with the second round of questions, which focus mainly on the opportunities and challenges in achieving the action plan. Ms. Ayush, if I can begin with you again, 
We know that the highly praised Universal Child Benefit Scheme has been under external as well as internal pressure for some time. However, instead of cutting down on benefits and coverage, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the Mongolian government actually used it as one of its main tools and increased its investment. What will happen to the scheme now? Indeed, as you said, we are having external as also internal problems now. <laughs> Precious. <laughs> um, yeah, stepping aside the social insurance, not talking about the um, pension and so on, uh, the social insurance. We, we, I want to talk a little bit on social welfare. Social welfare, social protection in that sense is in Mongolia is very also very high on coverage. Uh, almost 80% of the population is getting, we are having 12 programs, which is then also extracts into the 72 specific services. Most of them are not targeted. We are not having means test. We are having means test only uh, to food stamp program. And all the other services are you know, uh, more dependent on elderly or disabled people or alone standing households, orphans, and so on and so forth. The child support program uh, started also very early in Mongolia in 2006, I believe. And then uh, during the, um, it started with 3,000 Tugriks at that time. And um, until 2020, April, it was 20,000 Tugriks. At the beginning of the uh, COVID-19, the government of Mongolia has decided to fivefold the child support uh, program. So it became from 20,000 Tugriks to 100,000 Tugriks. And previously, it was also a little bit targeted. So uh, around 60 to 80 percent of the children have been receiving the child support program. So during COVID, the government has increased five times, has also decided to give out to each and every child. It doesn't depend whether it lives in Mongolia or outside of Mongolia. Mongolian citizen, child, everyone receives 100,000 Tugriks. Now during COVID, it was a very good decision because, because of the numbers of poverty. Uh, ADB has had uh, also uh, done a research how did um, it influenced on poverty numbers. So if the government hasn't had this um, decision on increasing the child support money and then uh, to, universal, uh, to give it universal to each and every child, the poverty rate would have increased to 36.7 percent, which, which was actually around 30 percent, so 29 percent. 20, around 30%, so it would have increased. So it has decreased by 0.4%. So that, you see, so it was very useful because um, in Mongolia we have a lot of children, but also the poor families have more children. I think it is in each and every country so. So now, of course, uh, the pressure is very high because we are spending, um, around 30% of budget, around um, last year it was 7% of GDP on social protection. So it is very difficult, especially now looking at the econo economical uh, side with the Omicron um, uh, version of the COVID and then also the, uh, uh, all the other geopolitical uh, problems. So now we have to decide how to move back or how, I think it is not possible to move back. I think the population, it is a big lesson, lesson to learn from, to each and every country that if you once increase something, it will be very difficult, even politically as also um, looking at the population social side to get back. So we have to kind of find a way to make it smarter to make it smarter. And of course, the social welfare has to be um, targeted mostly because those really in need might be needed more rather than uh, those who do not need to receive uh, the social protection universally. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Madam, uh, Ms. Ayush, for your categorical and very insightful response. It really was very revealing and wonderful to hear your very deep insights, and uh, I'm sure it's appreciated by all. Uh, 
I have the pleasure now to ask the next question to Mr. Samheng. Mr. Samheng, you have been part of the development of the Regional Action Plan, which contains these 12 national actions to strengthen national social protection systems. From Cambodia's perspective, what approach do you have in mind to implementing these uh, 12 actions, if not all of them? How would you go about doing it? Right, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think uh, some of the member states here, I think we were joined together in terms of developing the action plan together. So I think for Cambodia, we maybe also it's a good thing that we need to just kind of point this out together as a, under this meeting. Of course, policy framework, institutional arrangement, fiscal space, m and &E. So just me, let me elaborate a bit. Uh, the framework will scatter when we are not clear and identify all the, the mechanism that we need, the, the life cycle approach that we need to know to understand where we want to go. It's really tough. When we actually study it together, we realize that there's a lot of loophole and get on overlapping each other on, on our scheme. At the same time, we're looking into our institutional arrangement. Many areas of ministry, they double work would be the same target group, but the same ministry is doing the same thing sometimes. Same work, same program. Sometimes there's a lot of program that we are not looking into it at all. So we have to come back and reevaluate that. I think maybe the third one may be the most important one, uh, the fiscal space. So how can you maintain this tax revenue not while tax not increased, but at the same time how you finance an expansion program. So this has been the question for Cambodia for quite some time. Uh, so, but this, so this, I, I, I spoke uh, outside of the room with uh, Patrick and, and Srinivas about COVID-19 was, in a sense, was, was a blessing in disguise in the social protection program for Cambodia. Because COVID-19 happened, it allowed us to move all resources possible into solving this issue. And now we realize that solving this issue is allowing our population to grow better and stronger. So how do we maintain this now? So this is the next question. At the same time, we also, I think right now, we're actually in the middle of discussion. The, pro the, the system that we built in early stage was a targeting system. But at the same time, when you target people, what you also come with is the exclusion and, exclu and inclusion area, where we're missing a lot of people that maybe need to be in there. So how can we build a stronger universal coverage where actually everyone would believe into a social contract that actually allow everyone to be uh, joyful? But at the same time, how do you balance it, right? Uh, uh, the question was, if universal, which means some people that are well off in income security should receive it also in terms of the cash transfer or social security. But at the same time, a target group would be at least you have uh, an evidence that they are poor or, or, or most vulnerable. So these are the, the questions that we are balancing right now. But I think the last point that I, we did was, I think maybe the biggest one is break down the silo, uh, where I mentioned earlier was each ministry was doing their own thing. But when we start combining this force together, where which is a system that we create an M&E system that all ministry, four or five big ministry come together, sit on the same table, identify all the problems together, that's when we start to solve the real issue. Thank you, Mr. Tata. Thank you, Mr. Sam Heng, for your very uh, honest and very clear um, enunciation of the key challenges and how you intend to address them in line with the action plan. There's really music to our ears to hear such focused actions being taken. My next question is for Ms. Celia Reyes. Ms. Reyes, based on your long-standing experience of social protection research, as Philippines would, if it was to move towards implementing universal social protection, which benefit schemes would you see as key priorities for your country? Very briefly, if you can address this question. Thank you. Um, the Philippine Development Plan recognized reducing vulnerabilities as an important strategy to address inequality. In order to allow individuals and families to handle risk, the PDP seeks to develop a universal and transformative social protection for all. And for this to happen, a development plan recognizes that adapting and institutionalizing social protection floor as its key strategy to achieve universal social protection uh, would also be very important. 
And um, more importantly, the COVID-19 pandemic showed the significance of institutionalizing the social protection floor. I mentioned several key programs that we have been implementing earlier, but did not highlight that many of these programs also suffer from some deficiencies, including targeting issues as well as um, the uh, implementation gaps. And um, But what I'd like to... Um, uh, I think a highlight in, in my response would be two areas where we can actually, um, which I think should be prioritized given recent events and what we expect in the near future and also current implementation gaps. These are first social insurance programs and second would be social assistance or safety net programs. As we all know, social insurance programs pertain to contributory schemes providing compensatory support in the event of contingencies such as illness, injury, disability, death of a spouse or parent, maternity, paternity, unemployment, old age, and shocks affecting livestock and crops. So under this, I think greater effort should be done to improve responses to natural disasters, such as crop insurance to assist farmers affected by natural disasters. Expanding benefits of our health insurance scheme would also be critical, not just for dealing with pandemics, but also with catastrophic illnesses. Moreover, unemployment insurance would also be useful to help displayed workers cope with income losses. On the other hand, social assistance refers to non-contributory transfers in cash, vouchers, or in kind to individuals or households in need, public works programs, fee waivers, and subsidies such as for food and fuel. Among social insurance programs, uh, foremost are health insurance, crop insurance, and unemployment insurance. On February 2019, the Universal Health Care Bill was signed into law, providing every Filipino immediate eligibility and access to preventive, promotive, curative, rehabilitative, and palliative care for medical, dental, emergency, and mental health services. The law will address the country's non-functioning and decentralized service delivery networks, as well as its poor referral system of health services. And... Um, However, there have been issues and gaps identified despite the passage of, of the law. First is the high cost of health and medical treatment causing households to limit their consumption of other basic essentials or to refuse medical treatment. Out-of-pocket expenditures continue to account for 55.8% of overall cost, suggesting that the support value is inadequate and the no-balance billing policy for indigents has almost no effect. Another factor contributing to the high out-of-pocket expenditure is the limited access to well-equipped government health facilities, which forces many patients to opt for private health facilities in both urban and rural areas. Moreover, the devolution of healthcare services as well as the different capacities and priorities of local government units have resulted in various levels of health financing. Institutional limitations, weak referral systems, and a lack of cooperation between national and local governments, as well as across local government unit levels, have affected healthcare delivery in many local government units. Second, healthcare insurance coverage for workers in the informal sector is low since they are unable to meet their premium payments on a regular basis due to the seasonal nature of their job. Third, one of the implementation challenges highlighted in the assessment matrix of the Philippine Social Protection Operational Framework Strategy is that there is no common targeting technique used across local government units for field health sponsored coverage programs. Um, and also, this week, information management um, and accountability. And this is something that was very evident during the, the pandemic. The second priority area um, I think that needs a lot of attention pertains to safety nets or social assistance programs. Because of the pandemic inefficiencies in the delivery of social protection programs were revealed, particularly in the implementation of our social amelioration program, where data limitations constrained efficient targeting and delivery of assistance. Um, the D our Department of Social Welfare and Development was able to provide um, support to four pieces uh, our conditional cash transfer recipients promptly using cash cards, but they had trouble distributing grants through physical payments, particularly in geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas. In addition, there were difficulties in the distribution of uh, local government units because of the need to verify the list provided by our local government um, units. And um, as some of you might know, the Philippines ranked 8th 
in disaster risk among 181 countries and second among 41 Asian countries. So given the Philippines' inherent geographical vulnerability to climate change and natural disasters, as well as concerns of pandemics and economic shocks, the negative impacts of shocks must be mitigated by efficient and strategic social protection programs. One of my earlier studies showed that about half of those who are categorized as poor during a particular point in time actually consist of transient poor, while the other half are made up of chronic poor. So transient poor are those who are non-poor during the previous years, while the chronic poor as defined as consistently poor also out the period of study. And the study shows that are, there are considerable movements in and out of poverty due to different shocks, whether they are natural disasters, catastrophic health shocks, or economic shocks. Thus, it is important to ensure that social protection programs are able to help families from falling into poverty during shocks or help them recover more quickly out of poverty so that they do not become chronic poor. Thank this implies that... Um, social protection assistance like relief packages may be helpful in smoothing consumption in the near term but may not be sufficient to help um, the affected families move out of poverty more quickly. So I, I think that with better social insurance programs such as universal health insurance, crop insurance and unemployment insurance and more effective recovery programs, the population may be better able to manage risk and reduce vulnerabilities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Reyes. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts on this. Ms. Haswell, I, I realize that you may have responded already partially to, my, for, to the points that I'm going to ask. So just a very brief response to you. Given the, from you, uh, given the current economic climate and with seven years remaining on the 2030 agenda, what are the key challenges that you see for Maldives in reaching universal social protection? Thank you so much, Srinivas. Yes, it's actually some key additions um, to my further, my earlier response. The first one is that whilst we know Maldives is a very successful development story, um, there are significant challenges which remain. And whilst their income poverty in Maldives is relatively low, almost a third of the population is poor across several different dimensions. At the same time, inequality is a growing concern and is also a barrier to sustainable development, um, uh, particularly for the population outside of the greater capital area. One of the key things that um, is, is a major challenge is that Maldives has almost completed its demographic transition with the bulk of the population currently working age. And I alluded to this earlier, but it, it does mean that this shift is going to compound the already very high costs of social spending because of the geographic fragmentation and dispersed populations of the Maldives. It's very long distances, which is very expensive, with very small um, populations in between across that entire almost 900 kilometer long chain of islands. The most important challenge um, for achieving the long-term prosperity though, is how vulnerable Maldives economy and social system is to external shocks. Um, we've seen this, we know Maldives is a wonderful example of successful tourism, but this dependence on international tourism um, represents close to three quarters of GDP of the country. So we saw during COVID that when borders closed, the national budget almost bottomed out. Um, and because of the very limited land space, 99% um, of the uh, geography of the country is ocean, only 1% is land. There are very limited opportunities for economic diversification, which would stabilize fiscal space. There's also the, niche, the challenge that we have of a small island developing state, which makes Maldives highly vulnerable to climate change and other environmental hazards. This will also further compound the costs for climate adaptation and mitigation, and it's going to be a huge cost on the national budget. And we know that that will disproportionately affect the poor and those based outside of the capital again. Um, there's going to be a really important need to undertake meaningful reform of the whole social protection system so that we can improve efficiency and effectiveness of public spending, um, which will also need to focus on rationalising general subsidies 
and tackling inefficiencies in existing programs such as what I mentioned earlier on the health side, um, health insurance side. Certainly something we know that developing a long-term national development plan will be a key to achieving all of the SDGs, but also focusing on social protection. So we look at um, supporting the most vulnerable. And finally, more work will need to be done to advocate and ensure that parliamentarians on all sides understand the importance of the reforms and agree to the revisions in the interest of the long-term benefit of all Maldivians in a bipartisan approach. Um, just on a final note, I'd really like to thank SCAP um, for all of the support to the Maldives in helping us support the government um, to come up with an action plan in this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Haswell, for very nicely completing this panel discussion. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, uh, colleagues, our distinguished panelists have provided us with plenty of food for thought as we embark on the country dialogue on this agenda item. In our region, we are at a critical juncture to build back better from COVID-19. While doing so, we need to ensure that no one is left behind, whether in crisis or in daily life. Having social protection systems would go a very long way in uh, helping us in this endeavor. Our panelists have identified a wide range of challenges, but also key achievements and opportunities and solutions which will be required to move towards a more protected future for all people in Asia and the Pacific. So I would like all of you to join me in thanking all of them for their excellent contribution to this wonderful discussion. If we can. I now hand over the floor to Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Tata. I now open the floor to the country uh, dialogue under, under uh, agenda item three. Um, I have the list of speakers. Uh, please, the first, we have a video online message from a representative of Russia, Ms. Olga Batalina, please, your statement. Afterwards, we are having on-site Russia, Russian Federation. Please, Olga, and then Russia. Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги. Прежде всего, хочу отметить, что Российской Федерации были приняты эффективные меры в целях реализации плана действий по укреплению регионального сотрудничества в области социальной защиты в Азиатско-Тихоокеанском регионе, одобренного комитетом на его шестой сессии в октябре 2020 года. Наш ключевой и неизменный приоритет – это рост благосостояния и качества жизни наших граждан. Суть подходов к социальной политике в России можно свести к одному ключевому принципу – Человекоцентричность. Мы нацелены на учет жизненной ситуации гражданина и комплексный подход при организации поддержки или оказании услуг. Важнейший приоритет государственной политики – защита материнства и детства. Выстраивается целостная система поддержки семей с детьми. Семьи с низкими доходами могут воспользоваться ежемесячной помощью от момента ожидания ребенка до его 17-летия. В этом году такими выплатами будут охвачены 10 миллионов детей. Но наша цель не только поддержать семью в текущем, расходах, но и помочь в решении жилищных вопросов, а также в формировании постоянного долгосрочного источника доходов. Одним из ключевых инструментов улучшения жилищных условий остается материнский капитал. С момента старта программы сертификата на него получили более 12 миллионов семей. Еще одно направление для обеспечения доходов семьи – это развитие государственной системы содействия занятости. С прошлого года ведутся работы по переходу на единые стандарты. Основные услуги центров занятости занятости уже доступны в онлайн формате, идет постепенное преобразование центров занятости в современные кадровые агентства, которые способны не просто подобрать вакансию, но и помочь человеку выстроить карьеру, а для предприятия решить весь круг задач, связанный с набором персонала. Направление, которое также требует комплексного подхода, это поддержка граждан с инвалидностью. Для трудоспособных граждан с инвалидностью изменен порядок квотирования рабочих мест. Теперь работодатель не сможет считать квоту исполненной просто просто по факту введения должности в штатное расписание. Необходимо, чтобы такой гражданин был фактически трудоустроен. Кроме того, с 1 января этого года пенсия по инвалидности назначается проактивно, то есть гражданину не нужно обращаться в отделение пенсионного фонда. С 1 июля этого года введен новый порядок о свидетельствовании инвалидов. Гражданин сможет самостоятельно выбрать, как проходить экспертизу, очно или заочно. 
Следующее направление работы – это развитие социальных услуг для граждан старшего возраста. Помимо традиционного предоставления социальных услуг на дому, в рамках национального проекта «Демография» мы развиваем три направления. Первое – программа «Активное долголетие». Второе – развитие сети государственных домов-интернатов с тем, чтобы условия жизни в них были максимально приближены к домашним. Третье направление – это развитие системы долговременного ухода. Дополнительные возможности получат и родственники, которые порой остаются один на один со всеми вопросами, связанными с организацией ухода. Мы продолжим вести последовательную работу по совершенствованию социальной защиты, исходя из неизменности наших национальных интересов. Благодарю вас за внимание. I thank you very much, Ms. Olga Batalina. Now I'd like to invite on site a representative of Russia. Спасибо, госпожа председатель. Уважаемые участники сессии, несколько дополнительных штрихов применительно к конкретной программе работы сессии. Прежде всего, мы хотели бы сказать, что Российская Федерация, несомненно, высоко ценит роль СКАТа в решении стоящих перед регионом задач социального развития, особенно в контексте выполнения повестки 2030. Деятельность профильного комитета, комитета по социальному развитию, мы рассматриваем в качестве ключевой площадки региональной для обмена межгосударственным опытом и идеями по наиболее актуальным вопросам социальной защиты и выработки на этой основе, на основе этих дискуссий, стратегических политических рекомендаций и решений. В России действительно функционирует одна из наиболее развитых систем социальной защиты граждан. Важно сказать, что в акте высшей юридической силы Конституции закреплено положение о том, что Российская Федерация – социальное государство, политика которого направлена на создание условий, обеспечивающих достойную жизнь и свободное развитие человека. И наша стратегическая цель – это всеобщий рост благосостояния и качества жизни граждан страны. Проектом федерального бюджета на 2022-2024 годы на цели социальной поддержки предусмотрено направить весьма существенные средства – свыше 7 триллионов рублей, что значительно превышает до пандемийные значения – учитывая необходимость компенсации шокового воздействия COVID-19 и других негативных макроэкономических факторов. А социальная политика России носит комплексный характер, как уже было сказано в приветственном слове нашего первого заместителя министра труда и социального развития. И она, эта политика, охватывает все соответствующие сектора деятельности, связанные с выполнением государством своих функций. Детальная информация, касающаяся деятельности социального блока правительства Российской Федерации по ряду приоритетных вопросов, была представлена в виде обращения первого заместителя министра туда и социальной защиты Российской Федерации госпожи Баталиной. И мы убеждены, что эта информация может быть весьма полезна в контексте обмена национальным опытом и наилучшими практиками. Это, собственно, то, что стоит в нашей повестке дня – обмен национальным опытом. Дополнительно хотели бы акцентировать внимание на том, что в нашей стране, это применительно к национальному опыту и обмену опытом, в нашей стране по всем направлениям социальной защиты сопровождается повсеместным внедрением цифровых технологий. В России уже несколько лет работает сеть многофункциональных центров предоставления государственных и муниципальных услуг. Очень удобный механизм. Очень удобный. Он есть сейчас практически у каждого человека на телефоне. Около 100 миллионов человек сейчас являются активными пользователями этого сервиса. Мы увидели его эффективность непосредственно в рамках COVID. И еще пару моментов, после чего я завершу свое выступление. В части Касающиеся такой важной составляющей, как охрана здоровья, Российская Федерация продолжает вносить весомый вклад в глобальную борьбу с пандемией коронавируса, оказывает помощь наиболее пострадавшим государствам региона как на двусторонней основе, так и по линиям многосторонних форматов, в том числе в контексте обеспечения доступа населения к безопасным и эффективным прививкам. Наиболее известная российская антиковидная вакцина «Спутник-5» одобрена в 71 стране мира. Господа председатель, Российская Федерация настроена на самое активное дальнейшее участие в работе ИСКАТа на социальном треке. 
Особый упор мы считаем важным в предстоящей работе сделать на такие актуальные темы, как совершенствование системы социальной защиты на основе обмена национальным опытом и цифровизации предоставления социальных услуг. В таких темах, как повышение уровня социальной защищенности семей, включая кластер материнства и детства, решение социальных вопросов в интересах формирования здоровой, защищенной и производительной рабочей силы, включая аспекты рабочей миграции, обеспечение социальной защиты детей, юношества, женщин, инвалидов, пожилых людей. Непростое перечисление. Мы действительно считаем, что это те сектора, на которые надо сделать особый акцент. И в заключение. Всю нашу работу считаем принципиально важным выстраивать с опорой на принципы конструктивного партнерства, прагматически ориентированного на решение насущных для региона социальных проблем, учитывать при этом социальные, экономические и культурологические особенности государств-членов. Это очень важно с нашей точки зрения. Спасибо, госпожа председатель. I thank you very much, representative of Russia. Next to speak, Timor Leste, which will be followed by the Maldives. <coughs> Excellency, Madam Executive Secretary Veskap, Madam Chair, distinguished delegate, ladies and gentlemen, social protection is a right guaranteed in the Constitution of the Democratic Republic of Timor Leste. Article 56 of the Constitution states that every citizen is entitled to social assistance and security in accordance with the law. The following are progress made by Timor Leste concerning social security and assistance toward a more inclusive and comprehensive social protection system. Number one, the universal allowance for the support of the elderly and the invalids, SAII, targets citizens aged 16 or older and those aged 18 or older who are unable to walk due to disabilities. With Decree Law Number 53, 20 July 2022, the current government decided to increase the payment of social pensions to the elderly and the invalids under the internationally defined standard of extreme poverty of $1.90 a day. Hence, the beneficiaries will receive a monthly payment of up to $50 this year and 57 afterwards as a way of fighting extreme poverty in the country. SAII has been a very effective program as its coverage is about 92.8% of social protection programs. Number two, mother's allowance provides support to the most vulnerable families with children through conditional cash transfer for up to three children aged six to 17 years in a household. Annually, around $7 million is budgeted to benefit more than 100,000 students. The program is now reformed with the universal mother's allowance intended to support expective, ex expecting mothers and children up to six years old, including children with disabilities. In 2022, the program is carried out in two municipalities and one special region with the highest number of malnutrition and stunting among children. In 2025, the program will cover all municipalities in Timor Leste. Number three, housing for vulnerable families helps families whose earnings are less than $1.25 mm -hmm. with decent housing with an average cost of $15,500. The program kick-started in 2021, and to date, there are more than 5,000 houses built. The total budget allocated for the program is $82 million. Another important milestone in the development of social protection in Timor Leste is the launch of the 2021-2030 National Strategy for Social Protection in February 2022, which will guide Timor Leste to contribute significantly to the accomplishment of the Agenda 2030, along with other documents such as the Madrid International Plan of Action on Aging and the Asian Strategy. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, Timor Leste commits to improving its social protection system. Timor Leste is ready to engage at the regional levels, especially with the UN SCAP, to strengthen its social protection toward a more inclusive, comprehensive, and sustainable social protection system. Thank you very much for your kind attention.
Thank you so much. Next to speak online, uh, the representative of Mon Maldives. Please prepare Malaysia next. Thank you, Honorable Chair, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen. We are honored here to be today here as part of this discussion on strengthening general relations between regional cooperation on social protection and moving towards realization of sustainable development goals. The Maldives is in fact committed to the 2030 agenda and recognizes the importance of the action plan to strengthen regional cooperation on social protection in Asia and the Pacific that was endorsed by this committee on its sixth session. The COVID-19 pandemic and recent geopolitical instabilities have underscored the importance of having universal, comprehensive, sustainable and shock responsive social protection systems in place to ensure protection to everyone, especially to the poor and vulnerable. Recognizing the challenges and weaknesses in our current social protection system, gaps and inconsistencies in the existing legislation and portfolio of social protection programs, as well as the desire to develop a well-coordinated and harmonized social protection system for the future, the Maldives has in fact embarked upon developing a national framework for social protection for Maldives. This framework is part of the government's strategic action plan 2019 to 2023 and will provide the longer term vision for social protection in Maldives and guide the future development of social protection in the country, ensuring a coordinated and strategic approach by all stakeholders. The framework aligns with many of the action plans uh, highlighted as, uh, actions and also will aim to establish social protection flow for Maldives to protect against vulnerabilities across the life cycle. The implementation of the framework will enable the required institutional as well as legislative reforms and development, including amendments to the existing Social Protection Act, and will aid towards realization of this action plan as well. To extend the protection to the working age group, the Maldives is currently working on enhancing the resilience and employability of the Maldivian workers by establishing a sustainably financed unemployment insurance scheme, integrated and supportive integrated labor market services. Efforts are also ongoing to enhance and strengthen the existing universal healthcare financing scheme and the pension scheme as well to establish the first national, uh, and also work is underway to establish the first national digital registry for disabilities. As a small island state, challenges we face are numerous and require support and assistance of all development partners to ensure no one is left behind. Hence, the importance of regional cooperation cannot be overestimated. We express our sincere thanks to ESCAPE for leading this initiative and reaffirm our commitment to achieve the goals set forth in the action plan to strengthen regional cooperation on social protection in Asia and the Pacific, to work together at a regional level as well as country level in cooperating and supporting uh, to achieve the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, a distinguished delegate from Maldives. Uh, next to speak, um, distinguished delegate from Malaysia, following by uh, distinguished delegate by uh, of Mongolia. Thank you, Madam Chair. The government of Malaysia has always been committed to provide equitable social protection to, to all its citizens as demonstrated in the 12th Malaysian Plan 2021 to 2025. Strengthening social protection and service delivery mechanisms have been identified as key priorities in poverty eradication and building resilience to ensure an inclusive and just society. The government is working towards enhancing the efficiency of social protection service delivery to vulnerable groups including women, children, persons with disabilities, older persons and informal workers. With this in mind, the Malaysian Social Protection Council or my SPC has been established to strengthen the national social protection system. Members of this high-powered council consist of 15 ministers, the chief secretary general of the government and the governor of the central bank. The council serves as a centralized coordinating body to develop a comprehensive national social security system which is based on life cycle needs and taking adequacy, affordability, sustainability and robustness into consideration. This council is supported by four working committees on social assistance, social insurance, labour market intervention and data management. The working committee will execute and monitor the Malaysia Social Protection Framework, which comprises of five main thrusts, namely rationalisation of social protection policy and programmes, empowerment of service delivery and resource management on social protection programmes, determination of coverage on social protection target groups, empowerment of social protection target 
groups and integrity and efficiency of data management. Malaysia is also determined to strengthen social safety net programs through the development of a social protection database as the primary database. This database will be the single gateway as well as the sole reference for social protection programs and profiles of recipients that will cover the components of social assistance, social insurance and labour market interventions across agencies. My SPC aims to fulfil the national development priorities by adopting a whole nation approach with the principle of leaving no one behind. The targeted outcomes from my SPC are to optimise fiscal resources, to ensure sustainable economic growth, higher quality of life, a healthier and active nation, as well as to provide productive human capital ready to cope with the future and to reduce inequality. The government is optimistic about achieving the target of zero hardcore poverty in the country as planned by December 2025. This target is a new approach involving integrated actions by all the parties involved and continuous, monit and continuous monitoring to ensure no one will be left out of this initiative. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, uh, distinguished representative from Malaysia. I see Japan, distinguished uh, delegate from Japan is raising uh, the flag. Please, the floor is first yours. Thank you, Madam Chair, for giving me a, a floor uh, to speak. Japan attaches its importance to assistance for vulnerable groups, including women and children, in humanitarian assistance and it's providing assistance in a private, public and partnership by combining emergency assistance with medium to long-term development cooperation in order to comprehensively and effectively promote the SDGs to where no one is left behind. The SDG promotion headquarters has been established with the Prime Minister as a head and all ministers of state participating. Soon discussion at the SDG promotion roundtable meeting which was established under this headquarters, we are promoting initiative to achieve the SDGs with the participation of all stakeholders. The SDGs contain many goals and targets related to social protection. In the context of international cooperation, I would like to share some of Japan's under undertakings in the relevant SDGs. First of all, human security is a timely concept whose usefulness should be reviewed under the COVID-19 crisis. In February this year, UNDP released a special report on human security in a new era. Based on the recommendation of the report, Japan, which has been promoting human security as a pillar of its diplomacy for many years, will further disseminate human security and promote discussion on it at the United Nations through frameworks such as the Human Security Friends Group. Education under Goal 4 is an ind indispensable area for promoting human security and is a key to achieving all the goals of the SDGs. Japan attaches great importance to support in education and at last year's Global Education Summit, it pledged to contribute more than 1.5 billion US dollar to the education sector over the next five years. Given the serious impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on girls in a vulnerable situation, Japan, based on the last year G7 declaration on girls' education, pledged at the summit to support education and human resource development of at least 7.5 million girls in developing countries through math education, provision of learning opportunity for children who have been deprived of school education, and acquisition of skill that will help them increase their incomes. We are steadily implementing, implementing those assistance. Gender equality under Goal 5 is also important. Japan supports women and girls affected by COVID-19 in the Asia-Pacific region through UN Women. In Thailand and Bangladesh, we have provided entrepreneurship and livelihood support to women affected by the pandemic. And in Papua New Guinea, we supported the program to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in rural market where women sell agricultural products. In Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam, we provided guidance on the prevention of COVID-19 and distributed infection prevention supplies, including PCR test kit. 
In addition, Japan provides life saving and livelihood assistance to women, to women and girls who have been subject to violence and IDPs in Afghanistan. And through Japan International Cooperation Agency, JICA, Japan is providing support for women's economic empowerment through capacity building of national and local government agency in Cambodia. And in Pakistan, assistance for improving the lives and the livelihoods has been provided. Madam Chair, Japan makes utmost effort to implement the 2030 agenda with the international community based on concept of human security. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, distinguished delegate uh, from Japan. Next to speak is uh, uh, online participant, uh, distinguished delegate from Korea, and afterwards China will also uh, join us online. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in response to social risks imposed by COVID-19 pandemic and socioeconomic structural changes, the Korean government has been improving social safety nets such as income care employment programs to ensure no one is exposed to social safety net holes. First, in order to tackle poverty and social polarization via the establishment of income safety net, the Republic of Korea has been conducting abolishment of the family obligation rule in the basic livelihood security programs, livelihood benefits, expansion of emergency aid and support, child allowance expansion, basic disability pension benefits raised, and job creation for the elderly, and Korean sickness benefit pilot program, and etc. Second, in order to improve care for children, older persons, and disabled people, the Republic of Korea has implemented national responsibility system for dementia. Expansion of national public child care centers, abolishment of the disability grading system, and etc. Recently, as part of the efforts to uh, response to COVID-19 pandemic, the Republic of Korea has carried out various support measures to help people affected by COVID-19 crisis and ease public concern about livelihood. They include customized support such as damage compensation for self-employed and small business owners and emergency livelihood stabilization support for low-income and vulnerable people and universal support such as emergency relief grants for the public. The Korean government is planning to make efforts to bolster social safety nets for vulnerable people via expanding the basic livelihood security program and introduction of sickness benefit and meet various welfare demands through securing social service market and introduction of personal budgets for people with disabilities. Furthermore, the government will continue to be interested in agenda discussed at UNESCO, Committee on Social Development and Policy Direction of each member country and participate in related discussions. Thank you. Thank you, distinguished delegate from Korea. Please, distinguished delegate from China, the floor is yours, followed by Indonesia. Thank <laughs> 中国是一个有着十四亿多人口的国家围绕实现这项宏伟的计划全面开展参保登记 2014年到2017年 
，我们用三年的时间，在全国范围内组织实施了全民参保登记工作，组织各级社会保险经办机构采集全民参保信息，建成了全面覆盖的国家社会保险基础数据库。第三，强力推进参保扩面。在建成全民参保数据库的基础上，加强全民参保数据的动态管理和分析应用，以中小微企业、农民工、灵活就业人员、城乡居民等为重点，精准推进参保扩面，积极探索适合网络就业、自主创业群体特点的社会保险参保方式。第四是开展富有成效的社保扶贫。中国已经历史性的解决了绝对贫困问题。其中，社保扶贫发挥了非常积极的作用，把建档立卡贫困人口全部纳入社会保险，为他们实行代缴社会保险费政策，基本实现了建档立卡贫困人口应保尽保。中国的社会保障事业取得了积极进展，同时也面临新的情况和挑战，比如我国人口老龄化进程不断加快，全国老龄人口总量不断增加，带来抚养比的降低，成为影响养老保险可持续发展的重要因素。再比如，就业方式多样化，灵活就业、新就业形态不断涌现，需要增强社保制度的灵活性、包容性和适应性，创新社保服务方式。总之，我们将围绕健全、覆盖全民、统筹城乡、公平统一、可持续的多层次社会保障体系，进一步织密社会保障安全网，促进社会保障事业高质量发展、可持续发展。我们将继续加强合作交流，学习借鉴国外社会保障的有益经验。共同促进全球社会保障事业的发展。谢谢。I thank you so much, um, representative of uh, China. Next to speak is distinguished delegate from Indonesia, followed by Bangladesh. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, greetings from Jakarta, Indonesia. It is my pleasure to join you today at the seventh session of the Committee on Social Development. I would like to take this opportunity to showcase Indonesia's perspective and progress on implementation of the social protection strategies in Indonesia. As this meeting aims is to achieve our collective understanding and agreements on improving the welfare of the poor and vulnerable in our region. As mandated in our constitutions, the government of Indonesia has been playing roles and fulfilling responsibilities to ensure the welfare of our citizens, especially the poor and the vulnerable, including persons with disability and all the persons. Indonesia has implemented massive uh, social protection programs, including food assistance, conditional cash transfers, a cash transfer for students for, uh, from poor and vulnerable families and subsidized beneficiaries of the National Health Insurance Program. Admittedly, uh, Indonesia faces challenges in addressing the needs of the social protection. Mistargeting and uh, multiple deprivations are repeated and constant issues in the implementation of the social protection programs. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic has provided Indonesia with valuable lessons. The unexpected pandemic has brought inevitable impacts on employment, micro-businesses, food security, and poverty. Hence, improvements are necessary to ensure that our social protection system in Indonesia has the ability to address people's needs, including the events of disasters, to enhance the quality and effectiveness of our social protection systems. Responding to challenges, the government of Indonesia has started to impose social protection uh, system reform. The reform is expected to boost significant improvements in some areas, including data collection and targeting, as well as the adaptiveness, expansion, con convergence, and integrations of the social protection programs. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, we believe that uh, accurate and reliable socioeconomic data is necessary to improve the effectivity of social protection delivery since data play an important role in guaranteeing adequate programs and accurate targeting. Socioeconomic registry, or we call RECSOSEC, is a socioeconomic data collection of the entire population by name and by address, which is updated regularly and simultaneously at the uh, village level. RECSOSEC covers multiple data sets and information, including asset ownership, 
welfare level and rank, and housing and sanitation. Furthermore, this data offers data interoperability that, uh, so that we can have integrated database on a single identity number. Learning from the COVID-19 outbreak, we also believe that an adaptive social protection approach is urgently needed. So this approach, uh, the government of Indonesia aims to increase community resilience in the event of disaster. Indonesia also seeks to integrate three different policies and programs, including social protection, disaster risk management, and climate change adaptation. Furthermore, the government of Indonesia envisages a presidential decree for the adaptive social protection and aims to have 30% of national and local government institutions to adopt the system by 2024. Moreover, SP has also been accepted as one of the agendas for Indonesia G20 presidency. We hope, that, we hope that the members of the G20 will also take this new approach into account in formulating more adaptive social protection systems in their respective countries. Distinguished uh, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, implementing the reformation strategies alone might not be sufficient to achieve our goals. In addition, the government should improve collaboration between and among stakeholders to enhance social protection effectiveness, strengthen the capacity of related ministries and bodies, and develop adequate measurements to monitor and evaluate the efficiency, effectiveness, and impact of the social protection programs in assisting the poor and vulnerable. In order to do so, we believe that the collective support from other countries plays a significant and strategic role in enriching our understanding of designing, formulating, and implementing adequate social protection strategies and policies. Similarly, we welcome other countries in this region to take a glimpse of our experiences in Indonesia so that we can simultaneously learn from each other to improve the quality and effectiveness of our social assistance for those in need. I would like to conclude my statement by saying that our task to ensure the welfare and prosperity of our people is very challenging. But I have great confidence that our collective action will make it easier and more achievable. Let's join our hands as we continue to give our best endeavors, supports, and serve our people in the region. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next to speak, distinguished delegate from Bangladesh. Until distinguished delegate from Bangladesh gets back online, I would like to invite distinguished delegate from Mongolia to speak. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this year's uh, session of the Committee on Social Development is taking place at a critical juncture for SDGs. The COVID-19 has been the largest global natural hazard in the last few decades, and in the face of, the, of this pandemic, the social protection has become a central focus in the regional government's policies. Mongolian government remains fully committed to social protection, and it gives me pleasure to share my country's progress and learn other countries' experience regarding social protection. I am pleased to note that Mongolia was selected as one of the first countries to implement the pilot project, action plan to strengthen regional cooperation on social protection in Asia and the Pacific. In order to uh, realize the pilot project, we are working to conduct national report on social protection and organize national consultation in cooperation with UNESCO. Within this framework, an intersectoral working group was established by a decree of Minister for, for, for Labor and Social Protection with the aim to develop a national report. In Mongolia, the legislative framework of social protection was established and the necessary service delivery mechanism is being institutionalized. As was mentioned earlier, until 19, 1994, with the Social Insurance Package Law and Law on Social Welfare being adopted in 1995 respectively, Mongolian social protection system was fully state-subsidized. Today, 
our government's ultimate purpose is to achieve in social welfare sectors to deliver state service to furthest left behind and cover the most vulnerable groups in order to secure their livelihoods. For this purpose, we are working to reform social protection system, which is customized in line with our national context. Mongolia's current social protection system is aimed to grant pension and benefits for groups such as elderly, sick, those who find themselves temporarily out of job due to loss of working ability, the disabled and the unemployed. During the pandemic, we have taken quick responsive measures and delivered uh, social uh, welfare support through our existing social protection system to every citizen and as a result, Mongolia faced a relatively less negative impact. And further, Mongolia is focusing to uh, further strengthen social protection system in order to ensure uh, population development. Thank you. Thank you so much, distinguished delegate from Mongolia. Uh, let us check whether Bangladesh is back online. Distinguished delegate from Bangladesh. Okay, good. So then I would like to invite to speak a distinguished delegate from Cambodia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Distinguished delegate, the government of Cambodia would like to take this opportunity to thank NGNSC uh, in developing the action plan to strengthen regional cooperation on social protection in Asia Pacific which consists of a national action to strengthening social protection system. Over the past decade, the government of Cambodia has demonstrated a strong political leadership to strengthen and develop its social protection system. A key component of this commitment was the establishment of the national social protection policy framework with the purpose to develop a long-term strategic plan to build an effective and transparent social protection system. It has, for the first time, established social assistance and social security as two pillars of the one single system, a social assistance pillar em encompassing emergency response, human capital, capital development, vocational training, and welfare provision for the most vulnerable, a social security pillar encompassing pension, health insurance, work injury insurance, unemployment insurance, disability insurance. Additionally, there has been a focus on the prevention of poverty, vulnerability, and inequality using the life cycle approach, building on the national consultation uh, constitution existing legislation, as well as the ASEAN social protection framework. Through the building on this comprehensive uh, policy framework and its principle on efficiency, integration, and inclusion, we have seen a significant acceleration in the development of social protection. Let me provide a few examples. We have seen an acceleration in the establishment of the routine cash transfer program, including program for pregnant women and children under two, and strengthening the disability allowance and scholarship program. The concept of integrated cash transfer program has led to a development of family package of the integrated cash transfer program to be rolled out in 2023. The family package is the de facto subsidiary policy framework that will govern and inform the future development of social assistance pillar and has created the space to expand policy and program programming beyond current poverty targeting. Additionally, further integration has been ensured by the establishment as this year of the National Social Assistance Fund to integrate the delivery system for the non-contributory scheme as well as pension and veteran fund. In addition, and as a result of the COVID pandemic, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister immediately recognized the important role that social protection could play within the response to COVID and therefore fast track the National Social Protection Plan with the support and excellent cooperation from all relevant government ministry and associate agencies such as UNICEF, GIZ, UNDP, World Food Program, FAO, World Bank, and other key entity. This support from the highest level of the Cambodian government and the leadership of the Ministry of Economic and Finance has allowed Cambodia to implement an international recognized COVID response strategy with which also effective counteracted civil unrest as experienced in many nations when dealing with COVID. 
And just on top of that, Cambodia will be launching the first contributory pension for private sector in three weeks. The success of the Cambodian approach has led to greater understanding by all level of government of the benefit of national social protection system, with a significant ongoing investment being made by the Cambodian government to the Cambodian social protection framework. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Representative of Cambodia. I see Bangladesh is back online. The uh, uh, Representative of Bangladesh, please. The floor is yours. kind information that the constitution of the peoples of in the clauses of 15th, 17th, 19th, 29th, 29th ensured its commitment in ensuring equal rights of all citizens, upholding their dignity as human beings, protecting basic human rights, and establishing the social quality. We have adopted uh, various programs for social protection, human resource development, poverty alleviation, welfare development and empowerment of the bypassed and disadvantaged segments of the people of Bangladesh. All the programs are related towards achieving the targets of sustainable development goals, Delta Plan Vision 2041 and 8 5 year plan of Bangladesh to build a peaceful society with the approach of comprehensive development keeping with the commitment. We have some legal instruments for ensuring social security. The government of Bangladesh formulated a comprehensive strategy for its social security engagement to coordinate and co consolidate the existing safety net programs for better efficiency and results. The national social security strategy has been developed under the leadership of the cabinet division and general economic divisions and action plan of the national social security strategy for implementing ministries was launched in 2018. Honorable Chair, Bangladesh has made remarkable strides over the last decade by implementing a lot of social security programs like old age allowance, allowance for the widow and husband destitute women, for person with disabilities, education stipend for students with disabilities, honorium for freedom fighters, mother and child benefit, primary school stipend, school feeding programs, secondary education stipend, vulnerable women benefit, cochlear implant program, rehabilitation and alternative employment for people involved with begging. Now I would like to share how we are implementing these programs. For every program has implementation manual, Different triad committees are formed, including elected public representatives for policy formulation, budget allocation, and beneficiary selection. The government has established some institution based child protection program, integrated education program for the visually impaired, schools for the speech and hearing impaired, intellectual, intellectually disabled children the children with autism, rural rehabilitation for the persons with disabilities, well placed artificial limbs production. The government also provides the capitation grant for orphan living in non-government orphanages. We are providing medical aid to poor patients through government and non-government, 105 hospitals, medical college, and 420 upazala health complexes. <coughs> the Government of Bangladesh is committed to achieve the SDGs by 2030, where quality education for all is one of the influential goals. Government is providing free education, education at the primary level. A total of uh, 13 million students of primary schools receiving monthly uh, free In our country, according to the government uh, circular, our beneficiary are receiving their money through mobile financial services. Uh, we thank, it is our great achievement of Bangladesh government. Uh, government, thank you all. Thank you so much, representative of Bangladesh. Now I would like to give the floor to international organizations. First to speak, UNDP. Good afternoon. 
Um, UNDP wishes to convey um, our sincere appreciation to ESCAP for extending the invitation to us and making the, a brief intervention at the seventh uh, session of the Committee on Social Development. UNDP has had the pleasure of partnering with ESCAP and ILO on the joint National Rapid Baseline Survey on Social Protection to inform the action plan to strengthen regional cooperation on social protection in the Asia and Pacific region. This survey will provide an overview of the state of play and progress in achieving an inclusive and comprehensive social protection systems across the region and foster experience exchange across countries. And as such, the outcome of the survey will renew the baseline on national social protection systems in the Asia Pacific region. UNDP, as UNDP, we are especially delighted that this joint initiative is an integral part and priority activity in the 2022 integrated work plan of the issue-based coalition on COVID-19 recovery and inclusive growth, which is chaired by, co-chaired by UNDP and UNICEF as part of the Asia Pacific Regional Cooperation Platform. Social protection is an integral element of the global UNDP strategic plan 2022 and 2026. There's an impetus for scaling up and doubling down on investments in social protection today, especially in the Asia Pacific region. There are three reasons. First, poverty remains the greatest challenge to countries at a time when disparities in opportunities exist and are further exacerbated by the converging crisis that includes prolonged COVID, energy crisis, inflation, and food insecurity. UNDP's recent cost of living survey suggests that 71 million people could be pushed into poverty because of these converging crises. High food prices prevented 19.4 million in this Asia Pacific region from climbing out of poverty last year. And persisting food and inflation can keep up to an extra 42 million people poor in the region. Secondly, inequality is widening the gap within the countries. Um, in a region where top 10% of the population capture half of the national income, those furthest behind were disproportionately affected and will continue to be vulnerable. Third, the last mile will inevitably become a longer journey for countries in the Asia Pacific region, alongside poverty, slower labor market recovery, rising climate risks, and soaring cost of living combined will have a lasting impact among the furthest behind, especially among women, youth, and informal sector workers. Setbacks in the socioeconomic development inhibit progress towards SDGs. So in UNDP's eyes, clearly the needs are even greater today among those typically excluded from the system, but are now facing even greater odds. So the greatest challenge for Asia Pacific region is achieving inclusive growth with sustainability and resilience. COVID-19 pandemic has necessitated large-scale rapid social protection responses from governments to ensure that negative effects of crisis on people's livelihoods are mitigated. These efforts now need to be institutionalized so that countries are able to respond faster and incrementally enhance the resilience among those furthest behind, thereby preparing people to better cope with the future risk. To this end, UNDP values the joint cooperation with the government and UN agencies, as none of us alone can achieve policy reforms, financing needs, and upgrading delivery mechanisms required to address the extraordinary challenges of today. So in this, in this spirit, that we look forward to continuing our cooperation with ESCAP and ILO, as well as other partners on the Joint National Baseline Survey on Social Protection, and also subsequent surveys planned. And we really encourage more countries to take part in enriching the analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, representative of UNDP. I'd like now to invite WFP, uh, followed by IFSW.
Excellencies, um, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be with you um, here today. We'd like to express our appreciation to ESCAP for organizing this event and for hosting this fantastic panel on strengthening regional coordination for social protection. The panel has shown us the importance of maintaining the momentum around developing strong nationally led social protection systems and progressively expanding universal social protection in the face of unprecedented series of global and regional shocks. I'd like to take this opportunity, in fact, to recognize the leadership of His Excellency Mr. Boros Sameng in Cambodia, who with WFP has had the, we've had the pleasure of working with to push forward a strategic framework on shock responsive social protection as part of the vision of the National Social Protection Council. The vision ensures that Cambodia's social protection system is not only focused on extending social protection across the life cycle, but also shock-proofing their systems and programs to address the multiple and compounding risks that people face in their everyday lives now and in the future. This is really at the heart of WFP's support to social protection system development. How can we ensure that, that they are fit for purpose in an increasingly volatile environment and also, how can they not only deliver on poverty alleviation, but food security and nutrition as well? These topics we are seeing at present are interlinked more than ever. In 2022, we see that not only poverty, but hunger is on the rise, reversing gains made over the last four years. Up to 828 million people are affected by hunger in 2021, and that number has grown by 150 million since the outbreak of COVID. Over 702 million undernourished people in the world, just over 40%, live in South Asia. And the Southeast Asia region is also the most disaster prone in the world, in the world with 300 climate and weather related disasters between 2016 and 2021, affecting 70 million people. With a changing climate, we can expect the frequency and severity of hazards to rise, also putting pressure on our food systems. The current context requires a structure, structural and sustainable response, and this is where strong, resilient and adaptive social protection systems play a critical role. While investment needs to continue to increase, we also need to find ways to invest efficiently and effectively. What does this mean in practice and what are we seeing across contexts? From the ground up, it requires understanding and assessing vulnerability multidimensionally around poverty, food insecurity, exposure to natural hazards and so forth. It requires understanding how much it costs poor and vulnerable households to access a nutritious diet as most of their income and earnings go on food. From there, data-driven approaches and interoperable databases, as some of our um, speakers have highlighted, need to drive well-targeted programs that offer appropriate levels of assistance adaptable to external shocks. And lastly, it means linking risk-aware programs to risk financing to ensure responsiveness and flexibility and sustainability. These actions are seen to be intrinsic to the wider aims of social protection, to enhance coverage and access for all, to reduce life cycle risks, and to enable positive and productive contributions to national economic development. The shared vision provided by the ESCAP Action Plan for Social Protection offers us the framework around which to galvanize our efforts and WFP looks forward to contributing with you all to this process in the years ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Next to speak, International Federation of Social Workers. Thank you, Excellencies and Distinguished Delegates. I represent the International Federation of Social Workers with over 143 member countries representing over 3 million social workers globally. We are on the front lines of human rights and social protection with a shared commitment to human rights, self-determination, social and environmental justice. We commend the UN, SCAP, and the Committee for recognising social protection as one of the core strategies for addressing inequality and also achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Sustainable Development Goals. As social workers, we are committed to working with the United Nations to ensure that every individual, group and community has the supports they need to meet their full potential. 
The region is facing unparalleled levels of social and environmental crisis, climate change, pandemics, persistent inequality, displacement and increased conflict. These crises are intertwined and have profound effects on people and communities through the dramatic increase in economic, social, emotional and ecological challenges. The IFSW recognises that social protection systems are an essential component in eradicating poverty and addressing these pressing issues. From the profession's direct experience, we express a deep concern with the failure of current social protection systems, which often maintain people in poverty rather than working with them for transformational change. Social protection systems in many countries are sparse and fail to provide populations with opportunities to release, uh, realise their rights and potential. State social infrastructure, welfare policies and models are often designed to provide minimal safety net of support after a social crisis has taken place rather than working with communities to prevent these happening in the first place. Transformative social protection systems are one of the essential building blocks to eradicating poverty. We need to transform systems from reactive to preventative that assure everyone's fundamental human rights. The world needs new policies, new social contracts, and practices that foster relationships, cooperation, and partnership to build security and confidence for all people and the sustainability of the planet. Every day across the Asia Pacific region, there are hundreds of thousands of social workers working to assure that everyone's basic human rights are protected. Social workers are essential workers and it is a key profession associated with the implementation of social protection systems. As social workers, we're important partners for the successful implementation of the, of the action plan. We see the devastating realities of support systems that discriminate and blame people for circumstances that are completely outside of their control. Social protection systems will only be effective if they are guided by collaboration and cooperation and grounded in structural and systemic reforms. We commend the committee for the continued commitment to the action plan and as social workers, we renew our call for all countries in the region to commit to greater investment, collaboration and significant action to assure that no one is left behind. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are almost done. I have another just two uh, speakers uh, to take the floor. Uh, first is Development Welfare Research Foundation, and the next uh, is Pacific Disability Forum. Uh, thank you, Chair. What comes to my mind as a consultant involved with aging issues since last 35 years and as an advocate for the rights of older people, representing my NGO, Development, Welfare and Research Foundation, is that focusing on micro level is significant than looking at plans from a macro perspective only. Many livelihood opportunities to secure older persons were planned at different country levels, especially during the pandemic time. But sharing of experiences on what works successfully across a country, region, and nations is limited. For instance, there are individual examples of certain aging groups being given opportunities to start small-scale business or facilitating their absorption in income-generating activities or in sound financial investment schemes, along with the possibility of expanding, upscaling these as lifetime social protection. But what can undermine or encourage these initiatives needs sharing of intra and inter-regional experiences for bringing in marketing linkages for securing older persons economically through their lifespan and making aging populations self-sufficient, independent, and autonomous. This missing link in the region needs to be addressed by generating more inter-country research and publications. There is greater emphasis on bringing attention to programs put in place, but what is really needed is reviewing mechanisms that are working for their assessment in terms of long-term impacts the universal or specific intentional reach out, thus bringing in endeavors to strengthen social protection from a holistic perspective. The region can definitely gain by sharing national and regional experiences, 
notwithstanding cultural, economic, and political context for planning and delivery of social protection initiatives. But the strategies being adopted at present are limited to local level or national awareness. How can they be shared as good practices urgently requires academic and research community to work together and these combined efforts need to be encouraged by governments, civil society organizations across the board. UN agencies can certainly facilitate bringing in expert groups, senior citizens associations, representing voices of aging populations, government and other agencies interested in aging issues to work together at research level, provide critical review of existing programs and contribute towards policy and program development on ensuring robust social protection in countries and the region. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next to speak, the last speaker is Pacific Disability Forum. Please be exactly in three minutes. Our employee. Great. Fantastic. Are you now back online? Thanks. Oh. I go Madam Chair? Yes. Excellent ladies and gentlemen. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted inequality and drawn attention to the reality that persons with disabilities have been living the intersection of poverty and exclusion for far too long. Less than 30% of people with severe disabilities globally is estimated to have any social protection coverage at all. With onset of COVID-19, we have seen an increase in the number of social protection schemes being developed and implemented across the globe and in this region as well. As we see social protection schemes for persons with disabilities is being developed, important questions need to be asked. How can social protection be prioritized and sustainable, particularly in terms of fiscal space in small economies like those in the Pacific? How can we ensure that mainstream social protection schemes are also accessible and available for persons with disabilities? And how do we ensure that the extra cost of disability are also being considered in such schemes? Determination of eligibility raise complex questions for any poverty-targeted social protection program, even more so when the process involves disability assessment and determination. In order to comply with the Convention of Rights of Persons with Disabilities, assessment should not only be considered. Impairment activity limitations, but also the attitudinal and environmental barriers that faced by persons with disabilities as well as the support requirements, which contribute to the additional cost of disability. Particular attention should also be made to those who are in the vulnerable groups, so the psychosocial and intellectual disabilities, women and girls' disabilities, and ensure that sound and resource grievance mechanisms are in place. These are important questions that need to be grappled as developed sustainable and credible social protection schemes for the future. Inclusive social protection protection, Madam Chair, is an essential element of safeguarding the full and meaningful participation of persons with disabilities so that they can also enjoy and contribute meaningfully to the community and society they belong to. Thank you and good evening from the Pacific. Thank you so much. Good evening from Bangkok. <laughs> So um, with this, we are at the end of uh, today's our session. Thank you all for your informative statements, which have highlighted your efforts for broadening social protection coverage in your countries. Um, as I see, um, no further uh, comments. This now concludes our deliberation today. I like to close uh, my uh, today's session. This bodes well uh, for the implementation of the ad uh, adopted action plan, what we have discussed just now.
I commend uh, the Secretariat for a useful regional platform. On this basis, I hope that the committee can agree uh, to request the Secretariat to promote its uh, regional online platform on social protection to support our efforts to accelerate progress on the action plan. And of course, all member countries will be uh, collaborating and supporting you on this promotional job. I also suggest that the committee call upon ESCAP members and associate members to complete the rapid baseline survey that was distributed earlier this week as also today. If any delegation wishes to raise any other issues, this is the moment to raise uh, your name card. If not, I um, am free to conclude our deliberations today. I propose that the Secretariat reflects um, these comments in the decision of this committee to be presented in the draft report of the committee in agenda item 7. We will resume the committee tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, in this conference room as well as uh, uh, on CUDA and YouTube to consider agenda item 4 which is follow-up um, to the outcomes of the Asia-Pacific Intergovernmental Meeting on the fourth review and appraisal of the Madrid International Plan of Action on Aging, as also the Agenda Item 5, which is review of implementation of Incheon strategy to make, to, uh, make the right real for persons with disabilities in Asia and the Pacific. I look forward to your participation active uh, tomorrow. Uh, Secretariat, do you have any announcement? No, okay. Then I uh, announce this meeting adjourned. Have a good evening. Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги.